hopefully you'll, we'll have a good, um, lively conversation today. Haraj? Great. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. So this is week two of our uh, workshop and discussion. And we have one more for next Wednesday, the 20th at 530. Um, here are the questions. And um, let me go over the questions pretty quickly and I can dig into them in detail. So common indicators that recommend use of certain trusts, A, B, Q-tip, grant or retain trusts, QPERTs, et cetera. <clears throat> Uh, benefits of a revocable trust other than retention of control uh, retention of control on the assets and then reverse gift. <clears throat> well, let's start with the first item, the typical trusts. There's a lot more than the uh, than the few acronyms that were listed. There's the ABC trusts. There's the Q-tip, the grant or retain trust, and there's three types, the GRIT, G-R-I-T, the grant or retained income trust, the grant or retained annuity trust, the GRAT, and then the GRUT, the grant or re retained unit trust. Those three of them are similar, but the GRIT is a little bit different than the other two, that I'll, and I'll discuss that, um, give you an overview of what those means. And then there's a QPERT, similar to a QPERT, there's the PRT, which is the personal residence trust, as opposed to the qualified personal residence trust, which is the QPERT. There's also a QDOT um, for um, spouses who are not U.S. citizens, spouses of a deceased individual who are not U.S. citizens. There's a um, another trust called the SLAT, the um, Spousal Limited Access Trust. And I've heard about another one called the Shark Fin Slat. And I don't know how that, what that is and how it works. There's a, there's a lot of acronyms and for marketing purposes of a lot of attorneys who draft these things, try to call it with a name, with give it, give it a catchy name that they think is going to um, impress people or make it easier to understand. There's the DAPT, the Domestic Asset Protection Trust. There's also a, a, a DAP that is slightly different called the hybrid DAP. So what do those mean? But let's start with um, the, the first and the most important one. When a, uh, a revocable trust is set up, generally speaking with, a, uh, with, two sp with spouses, uh, two spouses set up a trust. <clears throat> The trust is drafted, and depending on the, um, the net worth of the, the settlers, the individuals drafting the trust, the assets are split into three different buckets, hence the ABC trusts. The A trust, the B trust, and the C trust. And what do those mean? The A trust is usually the assets uh, that are the survivor spouse's assets. Those go into a trust. And typically the A trust, because the surviving spouse is alive, the A trust is a revocable trust. So after the death of the first spouse to die, the surviving spouse can do whatever they want with the assets in the A trust. They can redraft the trusts, they can remove the assets from, from that trust and close it. They have total complete control of the A trust. The B trust is the deceased spouse's assets. And the reason why, thank you for um, outlining those. That, I think that's very helpful. The deceased spouse's assets are, uh, are included or contributed to the B trust. <clears throat> and for one specific estate planning reason, which is to take advantage of the applicable exclusion amount, which um, as of for 2020, it's 11.58 million per person. And then the C trust is the difference between the assets that are used to fund the A trust and the B trust. Let me give you 
um, an example using some numbers to see if uh, hopefully that will make more sense and you can um, visualize this. And this works very well when we have a uh, married couple that has uh, over 11.622, let's say 24 million, greater than 24 million. And so what happens is at the death of the first spouse, 11.58, this deceased spouse is half. If we split this into two, we'll have 12 million each, right? 12 million for the for the deceased spouse and 12 million for the surviving spouse. 11.58 goes into the B trust, which is the deceased spouse's assets. 11.58 goes into the survivor spouse, which are the survivor spouse's assets. And then the balance, the difference between the 24 and the, and the uh, sum of the two goes into the C trust. Let me tell you why this is done. At the death of the first spouse, there's potential estate taxes due. And when 11.58 is funded into the B trust, the deceased spouse's 11.58 ex applicable exclusion amount is used to shelter the 11.58 from estate taxes. So the 11.58 that go into the B trust would appreciate over the surviving spouse's life. And at the surviving spouse's death, no estate taxes are due on any of the assets in the B trust. Why? Because the deceased spouse's $11.58 million exclusion was used to shelter those assets from estate tax. Now, there's no estate tax on the 11.58. Why? Because the surviving spouse is still alive. And at the death of the surviving spouse, 11.58 or whatever the exclusion amount is at the death of the surviving spouse is used to shelter those, the assets in that, uh, in the surviving spouse, in the A trust. And over the, the, the remaining life of the surviving spouse, the surviving spouse will use some of these assets for their living expenses, make gifts and additional purchases, et cetera. So uh, it's possible that, that this 11.58 could decrease over uh, the life of the surviving spouse. The, the difference between these two which is funded in the C trust or contributed to the C trust uh, is placed in the C trust and no estate taxes is due if the surviving spouse has either a power of appointment on the C trust or they uh, make a Q-tip election of the C trust. Now, because the 11.58, uh, the, the, the balance is higher than the 11.58. Anything that, that the left, if the leftover is funded into the B trust, there would be estate taxes due. For that reason, the excess is placed in the C trust to avoid estate taxes on the first to die. Uh, ideally, the surviving spouse will spend some of the assets that are in the surviving spouse's A trust, the 11.58. Also, they could spend down some of the assets that are in the C trust. And if the assets at the death of the surviving spouse are less than 11.58, or whatever the exclusion amount is at that point, there won't be any estate taxes due on the second to die. The other can, you thing repeat, I, can you repeat the last portion, please? The second yeah. to die? Yeah. So if the surviving spouse uses some of the assets in the A trust, 
and also some of the assets in the C trust, there would no, there would not be any estate taxes on the death of the surviving spouse. In addition, uh, if there's a substantially larger estate and there's children from a previous marriage, the assets in the C trust could be substantially more than the 0.84 that we have now. And uh, under certain circumstances, the beneficiaries of the C trust, the remainder beneficiaries could be children from a previous marriage where the surviving spouse could be the beneficiary, the income beneficiary of the C trust during life. And at the surviving spouse's death, the assets would go to uh, children from a previous marriage of the deceased spouse, the first spouse to die. So and that's another has to planning, uh, Haraj, there's another can I... plan to get assets to um, children from a previous marriage. Can I have a, uh, just illustrate uh, a concept here. So several, several years ago when, and, and um, Hosean probably don't know this and you probably don't know this because this is an East Coast story. <laughs> so uh, Daryl Earnhardt Sr., right? He was a famous uh, uh, race car driver in, in the East Coast. And um, all of a sudden, one day he died. Now he is a resident in North Carolina. And that's part of the reason that I kind of know the, the story behind the scene. When he passed away, the number two wife, um, basically he didn't have any trust set up like this structure. He didn't have any of these set up. Um, but Junior, Dale Earnhardt Jr. is still alive and well at the time. Um, he actually works for the seniors in the company and he's also a race car driver. So both have substantial assets in there. However, he's um, the last wife that he has, Teresa is her name. Teresa then was named um, through the court, probate court, that she has, she owns every single assets without these A, B, and C. And um, so Junior then sued um, Teresa, <laughs> stepmom, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, the, the core battle was over 10 years. And because of the fact that Junior was from a previous marriage children, and that family, so there are two children from a previous mar marriage. Both of them work in the company. The, the, the biggest assets for um, Dale Earnhardt at the time was commercial endorsements. And so it, it's actually a substantial amount of assets. And, uh, and at the time, there, the, the exclusion limits was not even this high. We're talking yeah. about probably, that was probably a good 15, 16 years ago story. And the time probably the most is probably four or five million, something mm -hmm. like to that extent. And so this trust, C trust that you're talking about becomes really, really critical for those family who has um, different cho children from different marriage. Um, this becomes really critical where you don't, we oftentimes call it, don't try to disinherit your own child or your own children, if you will. And so in Dora and Har's story, at the end of it, Junior didn't get anything because there was no structure in place. And not to mention that the company that he worked for, it's no longer the company. He has no part of it, even though he works for the company. Eventually what he ended up doing was he went out and formed his own company, but Teresa still has all these big endorsements and still manage the assets today really, really well from a company perspective. So I just wanted to, to make sure that people know that when you have different marriage, different children, these ABC trusts still worked well um, to protect your own children, if you will, not to disinherit them. Excellent. Um, I have a um, client that I help who, um, whose husband died 
I want to say in 2015. And their net worth was not uh, as, as, as uh, was less than the, uh, than the sum of the two applicable exclusion amounts. And at the time it wasn't the 11.58, it was the small, uh, the lesser amount. So there was no need to set up a C trust. And here in my client situation, we have a child from a previous marriage and we have two children from the current marriage with the surviving spouse. So what happened was the assets were split into two, the A trust and the B trust, where my client, the surviving spouse, can get income from the B trust for, for life. And at her death, the B trust is going to be split up three ways, uh, one third to the child from, from the deceased spouse's previous marriage, and then one third, one third each to the spouse, uh, to the children from the uh, marriage with the, with the surviving spouse. Um, but the, the benefit here is to avoid uh, the estate taxes on the first to die, number one, or if the assets are less than the exclusion amount, so if, so if there's no estate taxes due, what it does is it, it segregating the assets and putting in a B trust, an irrevocable B trust, protects uh, the assets who, that hopefully will appreciate in the future from future estate taxes. Uh, but this is particularly important, and I'll get to in, in a few slides from now, if there's any modifications or is, if there's a decrease in the exclusion amount. <clears throat> The Q-tip is an election that is done, uh, and it it can be done. It's done on the um, uh, the estate tax return form seven hundred six, and it can be done on the C trust. And what it does is um, it allows. Uh, and there's certain requirements that have to be satisfied for this to, to qualify. And one of the requirements is that the a beneficiary, which typically is a surviving spouse, gets income for life on a quarterly basis. And at that surviving spouse's death, the assets in the Q-tip are included in the surviving, in the beneficiary's estate. And if there's can you, any, can you say that part one more time, the last part? Yeah. So the at the death of the beneficiary of the Q-tip, which has to be a surviving spouse, the assets in the Q-tip are included in the surviving spouse's estate. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And if there's any estate taxes due, then they would be due at that point in time. What it does is it avo uh, uh, provides the beneficiary of the Q-tip. Remember the surviving spouse is there only getting income for life. At the surviving spouse's death, the assets will be included in their estate, but they're not the beneficiary. The assets are gonna go to somebody else. That, that beneficiary, the remainder beneficiary of the C-Trust, which has made a Q-tip election, will get a step up in basis of the assets because the assets were included in the surviving spouse's estate. And if the exclusion amount is high and can absorb the fair market value of the assets, this is a great way to get the surviving, the remainder beneficiary a step up in basis of the assets. So, so in the other words, um, the uh, Dale Earnhardt story that if he would have to set up that correctly, then that C-Trust would have been able to do the step up basis for 
um, when the company eventually gets sold of the surviving spouse uh, as surviving spouse death. So that not would have the been B, a great- Not the B trust. No, the C trust. The C the trust, C trust right. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. th there's, now, the B trust is set up to, to, to freeze the 11.58 million. Correct. Correct. So that if it goes in, it, it appreciates in value to say 15 or 20 or 30 million, then there, it escapes the state taxation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, the the, the Q-tip election is done usually on the marital trust. Uh, and it depends if uh, there's an appetite to pay the estate tax at the surviving uh, beneficiary's death. Because there's a there's a potential that estate taxes could be due at that point. The um, grant or retain trust is a, uh, a planning opportunity to get assets out of the an individual's estate. The, the key here with estate planning is to uh, die with as little assets in your name as possible. And the goal for, for, the goal for that is to pay as little estate taxes as possible. And this planning idea uh, works like this. The settlor, grantor, or the individual that sets this up, sets this trust up, transfers assets into the trust, but retains an interest. What, what does that mean, retains an interest? It means that it, the person setting it up keeps the right to receive income from the trust. Uh, let's look at a, an example. We have an individual who has a portfolio of securities. Uh, let's, let's use a right, nice round number, let's say 3 million. The individual transfers 3 million into a trust and retains the right to receive income from this portfolio of securities for life or for a certain uh, period of time. This is the grantor retained income trust, the GRIT. You transfer assets into a trust and you receive a stream of income from the trust. And this worked pretty well until the IRS said, no, you can't do it. And the reason why this is, was the case is the following. The IRS said, if you transfer an asset into a trust and retain an income stream for life, we're gonna consider this as not a transfer of anything. Remember, after the death of the, uh, the person receiving the income, the corpus, whatever's left in the trust is going to go to beneficiaries, okay? But the IRS said, okay, well, you're transferring this 3 million into the trust, you're getting an income stream for life. Let's say this portfolio grows to uh, 10 million, for example, over the next 15, 20 years. You transfer 3 million, and then at your death, the portfolio is 20 million, and it goes to beneficiaries. And originally, none of this, none of the 20 million was included in the settlor's estate. Why? Because years ago, 15 years ago, the asset was transferred into the trust. That was the original rule. But then the IRS said, no, we're not going to follow that. 
because the fact that you kept this income stream for yourself, for your life, we're going to assume that you didn't transfer anything at all. You kept 100% control, 100% interest in the assets that were transferred into this trust. So the rule now is the following. If an individual transfers assets into a trust and retains an income stream, and the beneficiaries of, the tr of this trust are family members, spouse, children, grandchildren, the rules require the entire corpus, the entire balance in this trust at death to be, to be included in the settlor's estate. But if it's a friend or an unrelated individual, the grit works. So does this have anything to do with what their definition as a complete transfer versus um, so if it's if it's a unrelated individual, is that considered a complete transfer? And if it's for a beneficiary, it doesn't actually transfer it until the death. Is that have something to do with that? In, in both in both cases, it is a complete transfer. In okay. both cases, it's a complete transfer because this trust is irrevocable. But the IRS said that if if you retain an income stream, we're going to assume that you haven't given up any control over it. So what if I what if I set up a grid? Uh, what if I set up a trust doesn't have income coming through? So it sounds to me that you're saying that only if you retain income, right? What if the the grantor trust itself does not distribute any income? then does that mean that I don't have any power over that trust? Then in that case, that would be an irrevocable trust uh -huh. where the grantor did not retain anything. Got it. So, so yeah. does that mean that that's out of sight of the estate? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, so the key is that there's always, if, if the, for the purpose of excluding them into the estate, if you don't do any income, don't retain income, then that will that will work in terms of transferring outside of the estate. Yes, yes. The IRS allowed a couple of twists. They said a grantor can do a grit in the following circumstances. If the income coming in, coming back to the grantor is in the form of an annuity, the grat. So same example, grantor puts in 3 million, but instead of retaining an income stream for life, the grantor gets an annuity payment, which has to be, there's certain requirements for this. It has to be um, for a term. I'm sorry. Um, I said maybe uh, the income should be for the term, and usually you want to have the income beneficiary uh, as a healthy person to survive that term. So yeah, that's uh, one. That's one of them. And then the annuity has to be um, a, a fixed amount. Yes. The annuity has to be a fixed amount, which is paid out either quarterly, um, twice a year, or annually. So if the retained interest is in the form of an annuity, a fixed amount, then at the death of the grantor, none of the remaining assets in the trust are included in the grantor's estate. Mm -hmm. The grunt, the G-R-U-T, is very similar to the grant, where the amount, instead of it being a fixed annuity, or it in the uh, in the grit where it's the income that's generated by the portfolio, if it's a percentage of the assets, 
3% or 4% or 5%. And the way it's calculated, it's calculated on, for example, the 2020 uh, uh, unit trust payment is calculated on the fair market value of the assets in the trust as of December 31 of uh, uh, December 31, 2019. Let's say it's 4%. And as in December 31, 2019, we have 4 million. So the grantor would get 4% of 3 million in 2020. In that case, again, at death, whatever's left in the, in the trust is not included in the grantor's estate. So those are the two methodologies that, that were allowed to um, prevent the corpus, the leftover assets in the trust from being included in the grantor's estate. Okay, now, one so point that I want to uh, can, can I have a question? Yes. Um, so each time when I'm looking at client cases and looking at all these um, fancy trusts, if you will, um, oftentimes I have to kind of take a step back and see, is this worth it of doing it? Because first off, the trust has some cost to maintain. So when you look at recommending clients to do this, is there a certain threshold that you, from a practical standpoint, would you recommend them to do this or not? Do you have any recommendation there? Um, number one is if they have a net worth that's uh, more than 11.58 million or the sum of the two, more than 22 million. That's one, that's one, uh, the first step in the analysis when I, when I look at this. Then step number two, uh, in 2026, when the exclusion is going to revert back to 5 million inflation adjusted, and it's going to be inflation adjusted, not as of 2026, it's going to be inflation adjusted as of 2018. So that even though the exclusion is going to go down to five, uh, the amount might be closer to six or between six and seven, because they're going to include inflation adjustments from 2018 all the way up to 2026. So it's going to be five million plus the inflation adjustments for the uh, uh, for this nine or uh, seven eight year period. So if we're looking at a family, uh, a, a married couple, if they don't have twenty two, I'm looking to see if they have somewhere around twelve or more than 12, or definitely more than 10, mm -hmm. to see if that makes sense. So, so the other question that I have is oftentimes I see planners, um, and you point out a very good point here. Oftentimes I see planners, they're just, they just um, shrug off um, telling clients that, well, you are, you are at this stage one, right? You are less than 22 combined. And then they just left. They just left it like that, didn't address the point of the 2026 sunset. Yeah. So if you were to recommend planner to do, um, I guess your next step would be if they're, they don't have combined 2022, right? They don't, have, they don't have 22, then if they're in the ballpark of about 10, then that's still something needs to be doing some sort of considerable planning because you, we just, nobody knows what's going to happen. Definitely, de definitely, they definitely need to consider it and, and think through it. Now, there's a, a third step also, which has become exacerbated with this pandemic, and it's the following. Mm -hmm. For a long period of time before, when Obama was president and before Trump was elected, uh, the administration really liked three and a half million as the exclusion amount. So three and a half million per person or seven per couple. 
So that's also in the picture. Uh, and my feeling was that if a Democrat, if, if uh, Hillary was elected president, um, there's, a, there's a chance that this exclusion amount could have been reduced to three and a half million. And then let me qualify that comment by saying that because of the pandemic and uh, the, the deficit that is, is undoubtedly is going to happen as a result of the, the CARES Act and other um, uh, legislation being put in place to help the jumpstart, uh, jumpstart the economy, uh, estate taxes are going to be seen as the low-hanging fruit. And it's possible that we could revert to an even lower amount than three and a half million. Um, in 2000 and two, 1999, 2000, 2001, the exclusion amount was 1 million. And when I started my career in the 90s, it was 675,000. So I'm always trying to think a few steps ahead it's possible that there could be a change in legislation and the uh, having a, a, a grant or retained trust in place now could protect some assets. Right. Even if individuals are, have less than 22 or, or, or between 10 and 22 or less than 10, um, the, the, the other psychological issue to consider is, uh, especially in, in, uh, in an economic environment like we're in, where the stock market is not doing as well as, as, as it was uh, just a few months ago, is individuals wanting to part with, with their funds. And, and it, it is uh, something to consider not as bad in a grantor retained trust context because the grantor is retaining some type of income, some type of uh, an annuity or unit trust payment, but they are giving up a substantial amount of resources to fund the trust. And uh, there's that psychological step that individuals have to get over and be comfortable with parting with a chunk of, uh, of uh, cash or a chunk of assets that they will most likely not be able to get back even if they need it. The, the, in this case, the annuity and the unit trust will help temper some of that. But uh, it's something- so just, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Raj, I'm cutting you yeah. off. Uh, sure, so just correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think another factor that you want to consider whether or not uh, you want to use this type of trust is that you want to put uh, assets with, uh, you know, likelihood of having a value appreciation into grads. So you could actually kick out the future, um, you know, value appreciations out of the trust, right? Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And okay. one one point that I did not mention earlier is when the assets go into the trust, because it is a split interest trust mm -hmm. where the grantor is retaining some, a portion via the annuity or the unit trust payment, and then some of it is going to go to beneficiaries, a portion of the a contribution into the trust is a gift. And there's some specific calculations that are done to determine what is, uh, how much is the piece that the grantor is retaining, where that is not a gift, and the value of the portion that is going to be a gift that's going to go to beneficiaries. And um, that requires the filing and the reporting of, of the gift portion on a gift tax return. And because it's a future interest gift, the portion that is a gift does not qualify for the $15,000 annual exclusion. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, the as of today, 
they can use the 11.58. Every person has that 11.58 that could be used to offset any uh, get current gift tax portion. So no gift taxes would be due, but a gift tax return form 709 would be required to be filed to report the amount and to report the offset against the 11.58 million. And uh, as Chia mentioned, the trust is a separate entity with its own uh, employer identification number and its own tax return filing requirement. Uh, and if there's an independent trustee that is managing this trust, uh, the, uh, the, the annuity trust or uni the unit trust, their trust the, as there's annual trustee fees that have to be paid, which kind of eat into the, the appreciation of the assets of the corpus. The tax return um, ex um, preparation expenses and the trustee fees. And I remember <laughs> what, what Jan, in my class, and not in the, the graduate one, in my undergrad class, um, one of my students asked me between, you know, comparing grad and grad, which one is more effective in terms of kicking out assets out of the trust. And my initial thought was that uh, because grad, um, you have only one time asset valuation at inception, right? So mm -hmm. you don't include future uh, value appreciation in the retained income for the income beneficiary, right? So if the uh, value of the asset is going up, so the amount of income that the grantor is receiving is going to be fixed. But on the other hand, for grant uh, or yeah, for grant, uh, you have, you know, as the value of the assets is going up, you have uh, an increase in income amount because, you know, you need to reevaluate the assets, uh, you know, each year and, you know, calculate the income for the income beneficiary. But, you know, on the other hand, um, you could actually have more contribution in grant, you know, yes. you actually have more contribution after inception. Yes. So which one, which one, if you want to say, I mean, um, you know, answer this question, which one will be more effective in terms of uh, just sending out the assets uh, out of the estate? Um, it depends on the appreciation of, it depends on how quickly the assets will appreciate. It's okay. impossible to say, um, one is going to be better than the other. The, um, you're right, the grut, in addition to uh, the costs associated with maintenance of the trust, there's the valuation component too. Um, because it's not a fixed number, it's a percentage. So if you have, for example, um, uh, privately held at, uh, business entity in the grut that mm -hmm. is not easily uh, valued. If it's a portfolio of securities, valuation can be relatively straightforward. But if you have some type of assets that is hard to value, the, va the valuing those assets will, will create some cost as well. Um, and that probably is going to be borne by the trust itself. Mm -hmm. But it all depends on how the 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 um, the rate of return of the assets within the trust that that's going to determine how much assets will be taken out of the estate. Uh, the at the inception, uh, you could put the same amount. You can have two 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 trusts, a grat and a grat, and you could put the exact same amount in each one. But the way that each one the assets are going to be, perform will determine how much the corpus is going to be on the date of death of the grantor. So from a, um, uh, to kind of pinpoint say which one is better than the other, it, it's not possible to make that determination up front. All right, yeah, yeah. thank you. Sure. The, um, the CUPA um, is, a, is a trust set up to get the family residence out of the estate. And uh, 
there's some restrictions to this and the way this is set up is that that the owners of, of the primary residence transfer the residence into a trust they have the right to live in it for a certain period of time usually it's a fixed term 10 15 or 20 years or five years if they live uh, they have to survive that term mm -hmm. if they die within that period of time then the then the value of the primary residence is included in their estate if they survive the term the beneficiaries get the asset and the original owners the individuals that transfers the transfer the house into the trust have to pay rent and that is something that most people most homeowners who uh, look at doing a, a cupert don't get don't understand or appreciate at the time of transfer maybe they they are not advised on that point or they don't think about it or they don't focus on it so after 10 years for example the kids end up owning uh, the house because they're the beneficiaries of the trust all of a sudden the term has passed and the, the mom and dad who live in the house now have to pay rent to the trust. But what if they survive that 10 year period, the entire uh, value of the house that is not included in their estate. There's the restrictions of the cupid is that it can only have a primary residence in it. Uh, it can have some cash to pay property taxes and other expenses related to the residence. And if the residence is sold, it could retain cash for a short period of time. I think it's six months until a new residence is purchased. Uh, but there's some a lot of restrictions. And the way that the, the cupert is drafted is that um, it's not treated as a um, an income taxpayer. It's treated as a completed uh, trust a completed gift for estate and gift tax purposes but it's an incomplete trust for income tax purposes where the uh, set lower pays income tax on any income in that in that cupid and I can, usually there's not a lot of income in the trust but uh, if there's any income then the uh, set lower pays the income on it and that's another way of um, I guess depleting the settlor's estate by paying taxes on income within the trust. And that's, there's another term for it. It's called an incomplete trust. Uh, an incomplete uh, grantor trust. Um, which is uh, another way of uh, getting assets out of somebody's estate. The Q dot is uh, drafted to prevent the payment of estate taxes because a uh, non-citizen spouse cannot get the marital deduction. So what is the marital deduction? Let's visit that for a quick moment. When uh, a spouse dies and they leave assets to the surviving spouse, there's no estate taxes due. Even if uh, the assets are in excess of the exclusion amount, if everything is going to the surviving spouse, there's no estate taxes. But if the spouse is, a, is not a US citizen, the IRS is worried that that spouse will take these assets and leave the United States and hence not pay any estate taxes when the surviving spouse dies. So uh, there's no marital deduction for assets going to a non-citizen spouse. And the way to remedy that is to set up a Q dot where assets are uh, held in the Q dot with the, uh, and the Q dot has to have a US trustee 
the non-citizen spouse can be the beneficiary of the QDOT, but when assets are distributed to the non-citizen spouse, estate taxes are paid as assets are being distributed. So this is a way to defer the payment of the estate taxes, if any were due, at the time of the death of the um, citizen, U.S. citizen spouse. Now, um, one important consideration here is non-citizens are only allowed a very small exclusion amount. I think it's $156,000 a year. So the potential for the payment of estate taxes uh, is very present and could uh, be substantial. Q dot just out of curiosity, what happens when the uh, surviving spouse dies? The beneficiaries of the Q dot, the surviving spouse gets gets is the current beneficiary of the Q dot, and then at the death of the surviving spouse, remainder beneficiaries would get the uh, balance. And, and would the estate taxes be paid? at the death of the surviving spouse then, or would it still be pay as you go? Uh, if there's assets left in the trust, yes. They would be paid at that point in time. Now the surviving spouse does not have to take distributions out of the QDOT. And if no distributions are made, no estate taxes are paid. So everything accumulates in the QDOT. And the QDOT pays taxes on it income taxes. So I guess this is um, more um, relevant today than 10, 20, 30 years ago. A lot of um, clients nowadays has spouse from outside of the US. Yeah. And they have multiple properties. They have properties in the states. They have properties in a different countries, different yes. uh, jurisdictions. And oftentimes, these um, spouse are uh, purposely don't want to become U.S. citizen. For example, a client of, of mine that um, the wife is U.S. citizen, the husband does not want to become a U.S. citizen because he has he holds a citizenship of Singapore. Mm -hmm. Singapore has um, low estate tax and also in able to own properties in Singapore, it is required to have a citizenship there. And they have, he has a lot of um, assets in Singapore. And therefore, in that situation, then QDOT would have to be part of the overall equation, if you will. And if it doesn't, then it will have a substantial damage um, on um, 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 both of these domicile countries, if you will, because yeah. you don't, you, you technically speaking, you can get deduction from the other country, but still, that's not if it's not planned properly, it will have substantial impact on the state tax. Yeah, that's an interesting fact pattern. What the um, well, one spouse is is a not a U.S. citizen, and the other spouse is a citizen. The mm -hmm. there's also something in between where uh, you could have a situation where the non-citizen spouse is not a U.S. resident. And I don't know if that's the case in your situation. No, that, so that case was that he is a U.S. resident. He just refused to become a U.S. citizen. So he, because Singapore doesn't recognize dual citizenship. Exactly. So he cannot give up the, the Singapore citizenship. And if he does give up the U.S. citizenship, uh, Singapore citizenship, he cannot hold any assets. And he has substantial assets in Singapore. Yeah, so in, in, so, in this so that, situation, that situation, a bit different. Yeah, and, and it is, is the uh, individual, um, uh, because there, there is this, this dichotomy 
that you could be a, a U.S. taxpayer for income tax purposes. Correct. Correct. By living, by having a, number one is a green card test. Number two is mm -hmm. by living here a certain number of days. You could also be a U.S. taxpayer for estate and gift tax purposes also. Correct. And those two Correct. are not the same. You could be an income taxpayer uh, or you can be a estate and gift tax taxpayer or you can be both and you can be one or the other. Um, and there's different rules that, that determine one over the other. Being an income taxpayer is, is easy, easier to determine than a state taxpayer. Um, if that individual, that particular individual with the Singaporean citizenship is not a taxpayer for estate and gift tax purposes, that could be more helpful to that individual. But in, in, if the spouse dies and she has substantial assets, the U.S. citizen spouse, then the need for a QDOT would become uh, more important in that situation. Right. And there are many countries that do not allow dual citizenship. It's not Singapore. I think there are like maybe 32, 35. Um, yeah. There are only a handful of countries that allows dual citizenship. Most countries yeah. don't. Like UK doesn't allow that. So I, I have clients know. that have spouse who is UK citizen. They remain to be US residents, but don't yeah. want to give up the UK citizen. So, so there are only a very few countries that allow dual citizenships. Yeah. yeah. That creates some very interesting and challenging income and estate planning issues. Yeah. The, it's, um, um, it's, it's, um, wealthy people has a unique <laughs> <laughs> planning <problem>. needs. <laughs> yep. Right. <Unique> challenges. <laughs> So, uh, Harash, I'm sorry, maybe you already mentioned this, but can you just talk about um, intentionally defective yeah. uh, grantor trust? A yeah. little bit? Sure. Mm -hmm. An intentionally defective grantor trust is typically a, an irrevocable trust. So once it's set up, it cannot be broken or cannot be changed, uh, mm -hmm. at least not easily. And it's set up to be uh, defective for income tax purposes. Okay. So it's, it's irrevocable for estate and gift tax purposes. So once the gift is made, it's out of the estate. Mm -hmm. It can't come back into the estate, but for income tax purposes, it, it's, it doesn't, the trust is, doesn't exist. It's treated more as a revocable trust for income tax purposes. So whatever transactions happen in the trust in terms of income and expenses are reported directly on the uh, settlor's income tax return. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. And there's certain requirements, uh, there's certain provisions that if some or all of those provisions are included in the trust document that makes the trust defective for income tax purposes. And one of the provisions, there's several, one of them that comes to mind is giving the settlor the right to, to switch assets between uh, that are outside and inside the trust. So, for example, if originally the settlor put real estate in the trust, and then a couple of years later, the trust document, document allows the trustor to replace that real estate at equal value by, let's say, a basket of securities, that uh, power makes the trust defective for income tax purposes. Okay. There's yeah. a couple of other ones also, um, and you don't need all of them in the trust. Only one of them is enough to make the trust defective for income tax purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, Let thanks. me um, spend. So, uh, Raj, I have yes. just wanted to quick reminder that we are uh, one hour into the session. Uh, press move. So we are now at uh, six thirty-two. Okay. I wonder if we should. So just we continue wrap up next week. We have. Yeah, we should either wrap it up and continue next week. Um, okay. That Let me make a, um, a, a short uh, concluding comments regarding the asset protection trust, and then we can continue. Um, next week with um, uh, with the slides. So uh, an asset protection trust, and there's about 20 jurisdictions now that allow individuals to put assets in a trust. And this is a really very interesting area. Uh, there's four states that are better than than others but there's about 19 and 19 or 20 states that allow individuals to put assets in a trust and then remain as beneficiaries of the trust and prevent creditors from attaching or reaching into the trust and taking assets out of the trust the uh, DAPT statutes apply to individuals that are residents in those states. And the top four states that are very pro uh, settlers in the asset protection area are Nevada, Alaska, South Dakota, and Delaware, those four states. There's, there's uh, 16 others, 15, 16 other states. And so long as the settlor or the grantor setting up a, a, an asset protection trust is not setting the trust up to defraud creditors, these rules to protect the settlor. And what do I mean by defrauding creditors? This is what I mean. Uh, there's a, been a terrible accident that the settlor is involved in and there's a risk that the settlor is going to be sued. If the settlor sets up one of these asset protection trusts after that accident has happened and the risk is high, then the chances of this asset protection trust helping the settlor uh, is very, very low. So in those circumstances, they most likely won't work. But if it's done when there's no, there's everything is, hunky-dory and there's no issues or no problems and it's set up for asset um, protection and also estate planning purposes and then something happens later several years later uh, even though there's very very limited number of court cases uh, attorneys that work in this area believe that an asset protection trust will help help that set for now the hybrid asset, domestic asset protection trusts are for individuals like us who live in California and California does not have strong asset protection statutes that help settlers here. And we, uh, one of us sets up a trust in Nevada, for example. And that is a hybrid domestic asset protection trust and there's certain circumstances uh, where if it's set up uh, in, in a certain way where the settlor is not a beneficiary of a trust, but transfers assets into the trust. So for example, if, if the settlor spouse is a beneficiary or if the settlor is not a beneficiary currently, but an asset protector is a trust protector is appointed in the document that could add the settlor as a beneficiary at a later date, but not uh, currently. Those uh, types of trusts may work in protecting settlors in California and other states, even though. Uh, the trust is uh, set up and uh, is drafted 
by um, following rules in these asset protection jurisdictions like Nevada or Alaska. So we, um, Haraj did a, did a session about the DAPPT a while ago. So we do have a segment of a recording of that. So if you're interested, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to send the recording to you guys. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Haraj, for, for such a um, in-depth yeah. discussion so about various different use of the trust, um, including the non-US citizens uh, spousal situation and the um, DAPT. So thank you so much for that. And um, next week, um, so Anne, be sure to register. If you don't have any questions, or even if you have some questions from today, feel free to. I think put that Anne, in there. So we Anne, have, had, um, Anne had a couple of more questions that we didn't get into because right. I got sidetracked so, with all of the trust, right. uh, <laughs> the different trusts. So, so we'll, we'll come she has back, a couple we'll of questions. We can go back back to those too. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so Anne, you, you do have to uh, register and able to come into the room. So make sure you register again. Just, just tell us, see the questions from last week. <laughs> great. These are so informative. Thank you so much You're for welcome. taking the okay, time. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thank you, Haraj. Have thank a good you, evening, Anne, everyone. And, thank you, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Yeah, see you next week. Uh, Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.